got to hit the recording, so. Okay. Uh, you know, it's easy to do in here when we're sitting on a cushion looking at the wall and we're not being bombarded by a lot of stimulus, but it's, it's tougher to do when we get out into the world. So I think that what this parameter is really trying to say is, can you bring this mental state that we cultivate when we sit? Can you take it with you everywhere you go? And can you withstand uh, and forbear being bombarded by all of this stimulus and maintain this, this peaceful, centered, centered uh, frame of mind and stay consistent? So essentially, how I look at how I look at this pyramid is, can I take sitting with me everywhere? And so, if I'm in a situation and I've got somebody screaming at me, or I'm not getting my own way, and uh, you know things are being problematic, can I can I still have the same mindset of when I'm when I'm sitting here? So, you know, we're looking at uh, forbearance to a lot of things, which we could include discomfort, hardship even take it as far as, as poverty, being broke, and being in a great deal of pain. So I think all of those things, uh, things could, be, uh, could be applicable. I think it's easy to do when, when, when we're happy. It's, it's tougher to stay happy uh, when unhappy things are happening to us. But I think that that's, that's what, what sitting provides us with, and that's the importance of sitting. Uh, you know, I've talked about it you know, numerous times, you know, the biological effect that, that sitting, sitting has. Uh, one thing that we, that uh, they did the really large study over at Emory and several of us here participated in it. And they found the results after about six months of sitting, what starts to happen, and this is a process that continues throughout the, your entire life of, of sitting or career of sitting, however you'd want to call it, is that the amygdala, which is at the base of the brain and uh, controls the flight or fight response, actually starts to shrink because of sitting. And that the bond between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain actually starts to thicken and get, get wider and broader. So that's a really interesting effect because what that means is that uh, information that, that's coming into our in, into our, our bodies and into our nervous system is actually getting routed through the part of the brain that deals with long term cause and effect. It deals with morality, deals with ethics, instead of going through the part of the brain that just deals with flight or flight. You know, you get hit with a stimulus, you have an emotional reaction. Okay, so our practice of sitting actually provides us with the opportunity to respond, to have time to respond. And if you can do that, you know, you could withstand quite a bit. Uh, you know, I, I think of things that I've had really strong emotional reactions to uh, recently. And the fact that I didn't have them, uh, was, I think, was a testament to the work I've done here. And I think a lot of us can, can look back on that and, and, and say something very, very similar. So. I think the first question to ask when we're talking about Kasate Paramita is, you know, forbearance of what? And, and kind of the practical application of how does sitting dovetail into the, uh, the development of this Paramita and what this Paramita could, could uh, practice of this Paramita could have to do, uh, what effect it could have on your life. And I think, uh, I think the potential there is, uh, is really huge. And uh, I'll go back to the, you know, my original uh, analogy that I, that I looked at the pyramidas kind of like as a row of faucets. And the Prajna Paramita, kind of the penultimate one, which is the application of wisdom, is sort of knowing when to turn all of these other faucets off and on. And, you know, so the question that begs is, is it possible to be too patient and to forbear too much? And I think in some cases, uh, that's definitely true. I mean, I, you know, we've probably all been on retreat and talked to the one guy who was like super proud. He goes, yeah, I sat four hours straight and I was absolutely miserable. It's like, well, that 
that's great killing Eastwood, but what did you really get out of that? So, uh, you know, so it does, you know, if we talk about forbearance and patience and how we're supposed to cultivate it, you know, the next question is, well, how does this relate to project therapy? And because if you if you forbear too much, you know, if you don't eventually stand up, uh, then you're not taking care of yourself. You're not, uh, you're not protecting yourself. So that's uh, the next thing that I would posit. So uh, I'd like to open it up and of course see if uh, Hojo has any, any comments. Yeah. Um, I, in, in the recent podcast, I got into this uh, relative to the mass shootings and war and our stranglehold we had on Japan and they had on us and we're dropping the bombs on them and out. You know, a little over 50 years later, we're best buddies. We have to look back on that and think, what was that all about? You know, generations had to die before we could get over that uh, animus and enmity. And in some quarters, we're not over it yet. But um, so I think the kind of patience that we practice in Zen is different in quality. It's not connected to outcomes. Um, it's not that I'm going to be patient with my son, or maybe patient with my dad, or I'm going to be patient with my boss, you know, because in doing so, I have a better chance of making this come out the way I want it to. It's not like that. It's like being patient with the situation as it is, even though it may not get any better in our lifetime. It may just get worse. But as uh, Shinjin is indicating here, it's no excuse for inaction. Uh, to, to look at a situation and say, well, too bad, but it's, you know, I'm not directly involved in that, like these mass shootings and so forth, or the political arena. And so I'll just opt out and be peaceful in my little cave here by myself. Uh, that's, that's okay, but that's really not Buddhism. That's not Zen. If you want to do that, it's your choice. But in Zen, we don't use karma. We don't use any of these teachings as an excuse or inaction. Uh, karma is the result not only of acts of omission, but acts of omission. If we don't do what we should do, what we should do in a given situation, then it's just it's well, just as uh, karmically consequential as if we do something which we shouldn't do. So there's no escape hatch in this, uh, in this particular arena. Patience, we, the kind we practice is the patience that we have with situations that we cannot change. But we do everything we can to change those that we can. And, and Shinjin, thank you, Hojo Sensei. And Shinjin Sensei, another thing too, that as he mentioned, I like this faucet analogy as well. You see those six faucets, right? Um, but again, he talked about part, you know, plasma pyramid of wisdom. To me, patience is very similar to plasma pyramid because you can kind of just get over to a lot of the other you know, moralities and veracity. Because I mean, it takes us a a point of uh, of getting there and working with it. And like I said before, I'm very patient with some of the ones I really have challenges with and I'm work with. Um, and like you said, Shinjin Sensei, when it's when you're in a good situation in this scenario, it's a little bit easier to to be patient. And I'll give you a perfect example because I'm always folks that know me, I'm always trying to talk real time about so what. I, I get it, that you can spat out sutras and you can talk about, but so what. Um, for me, uh, and I feel a recent situation, and I know Shinji Sensei's had some job transitions too, just you know, recently. So I was, uh, again, a lot, some of you know that I do, I'm a nurse, uh, baseline, and then I do um, kind of informatics and management, program management now. Uh, so again, uh, had a recently had a really great team for like five years. I've been with my company for almost 20. And then we got transitioned to another area that just, I went from, my team went from being very cohesive and like a really um, tight to being, we went into a very interesting environment where the leadership, you know. So you go from that real fast transition um, and then you're just like a, so a shock to your system. And I'm always constantly saying, how can I bring my practice? So I, about three months, uh, they ripped three quarters of my team and there's still a lot of work and how are we going to keep this work? Oh, you talked about really sitting and being uncomfortable. 
with that and just kind of sitting in like, oh, looking at my ego and my value, like, am I that my really value? <laughs> so I'm sitting in this um, basically a pit of, uh, of self-suffering and delusion and trying to figure things out. And I'm really wanting this to be over. I just, <laughs> I really want it to just be, I died. So like, when Sujin Sin say yes, yeah, when stuff is good, yeah, it's like, yeah, I can be patient because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good and I'm getting, I don't have any aversiveness and I'm not trying to push anything away. So I just really had to use this, um, this moment to, as an opportunity to sit in it and what, 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 and I'm not saying that you need to create moments to work with, but every thing in life that arises is a moment for practice. And I really wanted to, you know, use this, um, and reflect on this and write on this and, you know, just so happen the Paramitas, you know, I'm coming back to it because we, the reason why we picked the Paramitas is because we wanted to see how the Paramitas can support the precept practice. Can we work with the Paramitas to kind of fold that around how the precepts, uh, what we vow or say we're going to do or, you know, try to aspire um, to, to be and do? How can this be um, a part in a really good uh, concept to use as a base of our practice? So, yeah, so that me, I mean, I really was sitting in that, and I'm really still, you know, coming out of that, which is good, but still um, wanting to work with um, being not attached to the things, then grasping. It was an opportunity to really feel, watch my mind and my whole body want to grasp onto something different and just kind of just like want to be anywhere but here. want <laughs> to be anywhere but here. And, you know, where a lot of you also know I used to practice Tibetan Buddhism for a long time. And we used to have a line in our ch chant, always learning there to be another now. Like, is the weather, like, it's perfect, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's like, I'm uncomfortable, I just don't, you know. So that, this has been an opportunity, and I bring that up, because I know patience can be one of those uh, parameters and things that some people have challenges with. Um, I also am taking a, a course in IBS. Um, we had a survey on Zen, and I had an opportunity because we were practicing um, the parameters to actually uh, write on the parameters as a part of the framework for our practice. And that's that, that such another book that I found very helpful with the normal picture or a little bit otherwise. And it's really a good study in the parameters in the real time, like what does that look like, you know, day to day. And he goes on to say that patience is the most important, he says it's the most important parameter. Um, because without it, everything else fails. Patience is very critical, especially when you're starting to practice. You know, your legs are hurting, your, your mind is running amok, you're just kind of really all over the place. So it really, in order to sustain that practice, you have to keep coming back to um, that place of being able to, 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 to be willing to keep coming back to the practice, even though it can be uncomfortable. You know, I was talking about that. Um, and I think even Charlotte Joko Beck called Sashin like, uh, contain a container of like suffering, like contain suffering, you're just kind of working with your mind. But that's the, the piece that I wanted to kind of kick off with the Buddha practice. But I just, again, as Shinshin Sensei and um, Hojo Sensei have said, I would like to open it up to see if anyone um, else has any comments related to patients, their experience with it, and something that's challenging for folks as well. Or what, what are y'all thoughts kind of after we kind of uh, had a few words about it? So You might explain what IBS is. Oh yeah, um, IBS is the Institute of Buddhist Studies. It's a, a seminary out on the West Coast, and they have like a certificate in Zen studies. So the, uh, I was talking to Hojo, and he said, "Hey, it might be a good idea to kind of get some foundational um, knowledge." So as I get, move along the path, but for me, again, like I said, I can study sutras and readings, but so what? I wanted to kind of figure out what does it really mean in real time. So, all right, let's open it up. Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah. Okay, Steve. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'm I'm out in St. John's, Newfoundland, back from my trip to Atlanta, and my daughter was just asking me what I was doing, and I said, "Well, I was in Atlanta," and she said, "No, you're not. You're in St. John's," and I said, "Well, uh, Atlanta. St. John's extends to Atlanta, so it's good to see everyone again." Um, one of the things that I have reflected on when the, the paramitas are phrased, and the one that I had, um, well, I said, I used to say, I am a great and wise person, I have no need of this one, was the one, do not indulge in anger. And on consideration of that one, and I think it's very close to patience, that it was 
do not indulge in anger rather than do not become angry. Um, and so that situations in which you become angry arise all of the time. And the question perhaps for us as Buddhists is, what do you do with that anger? And anger may be the basis for uh, seeking justice. What is, to, what is to be done in this situation? I am angry about the shootings. Uh, I am angry about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, what does one do about that? Uh, I am angry as of Thursday, and my first reaction was that uh, an administrator at my university is a blithering maniac of an imbecile idiot. Um, and that's a wonderful observation, but that does not stop me from what I need. <laughs> that, that being the situation, what I need to do is write the appropriate letter in defense of a colleague, um, and that that letter has to be toned down through several passages so that um, Mr. Administrator, thank you for supporting our proposal. And you've made, there are three errors in the letter. And so here are the three letters, or here are the three errors and that these go to the credit of the candidate. And I didn't even get as far as rather than the way that you have proposed them. So the anger can, be turned into non-anger and it goes to justice and goes to what is so and what is not so. Um, and I did have the discussion with, uh, with Sensei uh, last week, I guess, about uh, John Cage once said when he was asked, uh, is there too much, don't you think there's too much suffering in the world? And his response was, uh, I think there's just amount, just the right amount of suffering in the world. Um, and I never liked that. And I think Sensei clarified that for me uh, in the way that you have clarified it for me, that uh, it does not, there is suffering in the world. It does not mean that we should sit there like a piece of wood, uh, that we can go out and lessen the suffering. We do the appropriate things. Well, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think the appropriate thing is the difference between a reaction and a response with just a simple reaction, probably not having a high probability of being appropriate, but a response, as you just described it, taking time to write the letter and edit it and reread it before you send it anywhere it has a much higher, higher probability of being appropriate. I uh, and I think it's very important to, to distinguish between luxuriating in anger and getting angry. We're not, we're not given the charge of not getting angry. That's not possible. You're human. You're going to get angry. But you do have the choice of what to do with it. And I think that that's a, a big breakdown that a lot of people have. They don't realize that when they got angry, they had the choice. And uh, something Hojo told me a long time ago, uh, that you've got to look at anger as a sword blade. And if you make the decision to act out of anger, you're taking that sword blade and you're dragging it across a rock face. And you're going to leave a mark there for maybe hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. And so the effect is going to be there for a long time. If you speak out of anger, you've taken that sword blade and you've dragged it through sand. And depending on where you're at, that, that effect may be there for days, may be there for hours till the tide comes in, or maybe there for months, you know, if you're someplace with a desert that gets no rain. Uh, if you think out of anger, that's like taking the knife blade and dragging it through water. And it has virtually no effect. Uh, as soon as it goes through, the water closes in behind it, and you could never tell that the knife blade passed. So I think that's a really great aphorism to, to figure out what to do with your anger. Yeah, and that was vintage Matsuoka, probably an old Chinese expression. The other thing interesting, uh, he said knife and uh, uh, Sun Jin said sword. And what occurred to me immediately 
is most swords, uh, well, some swords are sharp on both sides, so you can, the anger cuts both ways. Yeah. Anything else on that, Steve? Matsopa also said one time, he said, people who don't feel anger and don't, he said, there's nothing to them. They're not alive. <laughs> you know? oh. They're not to become like a, a drone of no. emotionless nothingness. Is that what you're saying? Buddhism is not about avoiding suffering. It's about confronting suffering. The, the, the piece is the, the, the branch that falls out of the tree on you is not angry at you. So you can't, you can't uh, ascribe um, anger motives. Uh, it's, it's always struck me, especially in the Byram translation of the Dhammapada, that it's, look, look how he beat me, look, look how he robbed me, look how he threw me down. Live with those thoughts and you live in hate. So to indulge in anger, as you have said, to carry, to carry that around with you. In the old S training, they used to talk about uh, carrying, carrying your chair uh, on your back everywhere you went you you carried your chair and when you met somebody you would bring that around to the front and said want to meet my chair uh, and you weren't meeting the person you were meeting the chair that you were meeting the things that they were carrying around so yes I, and and just wanting to say to sensei yes but um you could throw a very large rock into the water and the ripples from that rock uh, might be uh, they could do a great deal of damage and that well we're not going to talk about that tea person but uh, there are thoughts that become expressed and they create waves that are going to do damage um, the geological example it was in uh, one of the earthquakes in near Anchorage that uh, a large an earthquake caused a large piece of earth to fall into the water uh, and the result of that was as has been estimated a 1700 foot tsunami wave or if you elevate it to the level of a meteor that's a pretty big rock yes yeah and that has uh, but it's but it's not angry at us it's just Rocks rock. In a recent uh, podcast, I was describing, trying to describe the situation we're facing in, in broad brush strokes, and uh, said, and, and, and then use the phrase, an increasingly angry sun. I don't know if you've ever seen close up video of the sun or, or animations of it. It's just a horrifying, it's a terrifying thing. And uh, because of uh, what we've done, apparently done with the atmosphere. Um, we are facing drought and forest fires and so forth. So that all appears as anger to a species that would like to survive. But um, so I think we can use it poetically. We can say an increasingly angry sun. I considered, thought about it, and I decided to leave it. Because uh, that's what we're doing. We're turning our the anger is coming back on us. Mother nature ain't happy. No, mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Don't, don't fool with Mother Nature. So the rest of you, what, what do the rest of you feel about what you've heard so far? Somebody come out. We're not going to call you out. Is somebody in the room? Lee, Lee is a newcomer. Maybe Lee has something to say as a newcomer. I think I missed what Robert said a while ago. Maybe I have to repeat that. Oh, I just said, uh, don't be a stone Buddha. I know. Stoned or stone? <laughs> um, one of the best benefits of practice is learning to move, live and manage, live with and manage my anger. And, and, and I, think I became and will become angry and frustrated. Exposed to this, it's kind of like a character that comes up with Neuroda. The concept of Neuroda, um, you know, is is something that for me, it, a 
of containment it has just been a huge insight for me as it, as is this because i always felt just i was just exposed but i had no protection i had no protection explain what need order means pardon me can you explain what need order means probably not very well but i think it's containing the the, the idea is that you contain um uh you're, you're protecting yourself it's a containment thing if i'm understanding it uh, and that it can protect you against you know, your weaknesses I mean, in this case impatience anger i i just always felt exposed to it because i thought that's the way of the world that's what it is you just have to stand there and take it and my practice has been extremely helpful for me when you don't you know, i can actually manage it and i i I'm a polyamorous. I, you know, I that's a good thing for me. I'm happy for it very clear. And I, I and, uh, it's one of the reasons I keep coming back to my practice. Anyone else online? There are a lot of happy, smiling faces and cool-looking names. Go ahead, Michael. Michael. Yeah. So. Um, Personally, I just moved. Um, I moved into a townhouse and my neighbor's HVAC leaking water into my unit. So I spent all this money to move in. And then, of course, dealing with insurance companies, it's been stressful. Um, and I kind of got to a point where I was like, where's my practice? My practice is supposed to stop me from feeling this stress. And I realized that thought is kind of trying to use the practice for this anti-stress thing. And that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be seeing reality. Um, but how do we kind of, there's kind of a balance there where we want that, those good brain changes um, that <clears throat> Shinjin Sensei was talking about, but we're also not supposed to use it for these goals, these things. Uh, there's a balance there somewhere where we want the anti-stress. <laughs> uh, we also realize it's not exactly for that. <clears throat> I wonder what the group has to say about that. Well, Maybe, maybe not. Uh, instead of looking at it in terms of, I've got this goal, look at it in terms of my intent. Because if you look at the right, you know, the April path, it essentially starts with right intent. What do you, what do you, what do you intend to do? You know, look at it in terms of that instead of, you know, here's this outcome that I demand. Because as soon as we start demanding any kind of outcome, you know, we're, we're going to wind up disappointed or angry frustrated or any one of those things. So I would say start with right intent. And if your intent is, you know, I'm going to keep my level headedness, keep my samadhi, regardless of how this plays out. You know, I think that's a very different different spin on the process. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and, and I realize that, you know, as that's all going on, but I think like it I still, I still kind of want it, <laughs> even though I realize. Well, of, of course, who wants to live with a living roof? But I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, a leaking roof. But you're probably doing better than you think you're doing. I mean, your neighbor's still yeah. alive, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. You're already off to a great start. I, I won. I didn't kill him. <laughs> you haven't shot the guy, so you're already off to a great start. Yeah. Steve, I see your hand up comments there. Yeah, I, Michael, it's, I, I appreciate the situation. I'm thinking of the old Southern story about, uh, uh, well, I've got a leaking roof. Well, why don't you fix it? Well, it's not raining. Um, and why uh, now I've got a leaking roof while well, it's raining. Well, I can't fix it while it's raining. Um, I, going back to this one where I thought, well, I don't have a problem with anger and then realizing that I did have a problem with anger is it's not indulging in anger. I found the purpose is not to be, is not to become, our practice is not, don't become angry. Our practice is don't indulge in anger. And after a while, when you break the connection between becoming angry and anger getting what it wants, which is the self-satisfaction of screaming at somebody 
and being self-righteous and I am superior to you because I can argue in a much more efficient way than you can. When, when the link between becoming angry and indulging in anger is broken, the anger has no place to go and the anger arises less often. Um, and, and I think that this is also true of, of many of the other things that are of concern with, uh, with, with the paramitas is there's the, there are these primary raw emotions that, that burble out inappropriately. And our practice is to observe those emotions, um, follow our precepts, follow the perfections, and where perfect, the, the aim of perfection is not to become perfect, but it is to, uh, it's, it's a verb. Perfection is, a, is actually a participle. Uh, sorry that I'm a university professor, but it's a participle. So it's not, it's not, the intention of Zen is not to make us better persons. The intention of Zen is to, is to see things the way they are and seeing things the way they are in and of itself winds that leads to perfection but perfection is a path it's not it's not a state if you think that you're perfect um you're probably mistaken in fact i can almost it's better to use uh perfecting the germ yeah and to um i do want to say this the fact that you're noticing what you're doing is so important. Um, for me, what I find too is that in the practice, things naturally arise and you start to realize that your life is no different than the practice. So the fact that you're thinking about what you're doing and what your mind wants to do, like me, like I was like, oh, I don't want to be here, right? Yeah, you're just like freaking, I don't want my, like, it, my roof to fall in and just, you know, right? But I feel like I really want to point it right back at you and say, at least you're noticing. And that's a part, a very important part of the practice. What other thoughts do people have? Uh, again, we talked about the, the practice uh, of patience and the when we were sitting. Part of the, the Dharma too, when I first started practicing, I know the Dharma was, uh, when you're talking about the different sutras, and that my Shinjin Sensei would sometimes make my head hurt because he'd be like, I was like, oh my God, he just went into the whole other, you know, and I'd have to be like, I, I didn't get it. And then I'd come back to it again, and I'm like, oh, that's what he's probably meaning. But I think, too, even with the Dharma, you'll see me trying to drop some things in about Buddha Dharma. <laughs> um, but because the Dharma itself can be so broad and intense and just really sitting with it. You know, because initially when you're exposed to it, like when you're like reading, trying to read Dogen, or you're trying to read uh, the different sutras, uh, it's just kind of like way over your head sometimes. But again, when you approach it as a, from a way of being open to it, and do that's kind of how patience settles into that, and just being really gentle with yourself with it. So you're not supposed to get everything all the time, but what we really concentrate here in our practice is the experience with it. The teachings are others' perceptions of what they noticed in their own practice, trying to give us hints about what we can potentially watch out for in our own practice. So um, Hojo, Shinjin Sensei, any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, I think a question I would ask everybody, um, we often talk about what is the key, what is the one thing that seems to be getting in your way in terms of your practice? So you can also you could also consider that question in terms of patience. What is the one thing that most pushes your buttons? And we have a hand up. Yeah. Hey, Alan. He was saying he was. I'm so happy to see you because I didn't know if you're going to make it because he's like on the call. So it's good to see you, sir. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? I'm on a couple different. Uh, my audible. We can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I, I am actually uh, on call. So forgive me if I have to dive away. But uh, I just wanted to, um, I guess, if to share my thoughts, uh, this um, chapter reading on on Kisanti, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, patience, tolerance, temperance, all the different, you know, I think sort they, of, hey, is that, this is one thing we want to be patient with is pronunciation. 
<laughs> a, lot, a lot of people make a big deal of it, but I think the K is actually meant to be silent, so it's more like Shanti. Shanti. Well, I appreciate that patience too. Um, the, um, this has really just been thinking about this has really been permeating my my mind, which has been great. Um, you know, I was reading this chapter through. Um, you know, I recently I got I was diagnosed with cancer and I had surgery and had my whole stomach removed and I'm just reading this, you know, chapter on patience and tolerance the whole time and it and it really just I think that was good helped helped it really stick, you know, um, it was it was very useful to me just for that. But then I um, I started to realize, you know, all of that was what got me coming back to to um, pursue. That's not too uh, simple a word, uh, you know, Zen practice. Um, and I, I had kind of a false start, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And, and um, I always attributed um, not sticking with it to a lack of discipline. And I think I'm starting to realize it's really more of a lack of patience that um, kept me from, from, you know, keeping with it. And then I'm, and I'm, I'm starting to see, um, speaking about starting to see things as they really are um this lack of patience and tolerance and temperance etc being um kind of the root of a lot of a lot of um bad stuff going on uh from from the way our justice system is to to, to these mass shootings to just the way uh, systems miss you know malfunction in our society is just a lack of um, patience. A lot of people just having a lack of patience, you know, seeking vengeance instead of justice and all that. I kind of am seeing, you know, a lack of patience as, as at least part of the root of that. And I guess rather than just focusing on myself and how, you know, more patience helps me sit and, you know, in my corner on my, on my cushion and, and um, practice Zen, you know, how, how do we, other than just, you know, maybe being a good example, how do we start to, 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 I don't know, teach or, or move patients into the rest of the rest of, you know, the world to the rest of to other sentient beings so that we can kind of help some of these things going on. Any questions? I'll let, uh, Shinjin and Hojo Sensei, um, I know I have a few thoughts on that, but uh, Shinjin and Hojo, thoughts on that? Well, I think that's the, that's the million dollar question, to be honest with you. I don't think there's an easy way to answer it. Um, I have a yeah. suggestion, um, which I give to a lot of people. I was trained train in design. Uh, graphic and industrial design and all that, but it's also trained in research, uh, in user research. And so uh, I was trained in what is called the Rogerian method Carl Rogers developed in World War II, where he had to interview draftees who were resistant to uh, talking and how to establish rapport, get them to trust him, open up and talk. So I think a lot of these situations that we're in where the impatience comes from, and both sides are kind of in a, excuse my language, pissing contest, or, you know, trying to, uh, my opinion against your opinion, that kind of thing. So those of you who are having difficulty at work and in, say, family dialogues uh, around these issues, please send me a note and I'll send this, I have a three-page paper on, that I condense the method down to pretty, uh, pretty simple outline approach where instead of engaging a dialogue with another person where you feel called upon to defend your position, this allows you to interview the other person in such a way that they don't even know you're interviewing them. And uh, they get the impression that you're really interested in them, whether you are or not. <laughs> it's very powerful in that sense. <laughs> and uh, it can be misused for uh, nefarious purposes, but it's a very powerful approach. It took me about three years to become more natural at it when I was being trained and doing research as an interviewer. And um, it allows you to get to a deeper level 
with the person, an individual, and in a group, it allows you to handle a group where it's called non-directive interview technique. You don't really direct the interview, but you learn how to use it, and uh, where you don't have to defend yourself, and it relieves you of the burden of having to engage the dialogue on their terms. And uh, once they start opening up, you might find out that on a very basic level, they are, have the same fears that you have or anxieties, but they are maybe trying to approach them in a less efficient or ep more inept way. And so uh, at any point, you can turn it around and jump in and have an opinion. But, um, you know, if you don't want to do that in a sticky situation, it allows you to maintain a, a respectful dialogue without actually having an opinion about the subject that you're discussing. And so that, that goes a long way to relieving that kind of social pressure in, in transactional situations with other individuals. Anyone else have thoughts uh, for Alan? You know, Alan, I always have a thought. I like to give other people an opportunity. I have to pause and, <laughs> but um, what Hojo Sensei is saying, your your question was like, how do you, you know, want that transmute this patience to other people? Well, the first place is what he's talking about, how to bring that out in the interactions that you have in the world. So it's always pointing back at you, like, how are you? Because now I feel like you're understanding that it's not really you trying to try, trying to do anything to someone else, but it's really like you said you're starting to realize the you know see things as they really are, and then what your intent is, and not immediately going into your place of wanting to fix it or you're trying to do something to it, but your intent is to basically see and have some room and space. Like I've heard Susan say say very clearly today, reaction versus response. You know, and giving that enough room to be able to see the difference between those two. So, you know, always, you know, everybody knows about be the change you wish to see. So how you interact and in, are in your intent with other people, it starts with you. And that's how you start to, for me, show and show up in your practice, you know, not trying to get anything from it. But as you're seeing things as they really are, how are you working in different situations? And like you said, bring that aspect of the primary of patience into every interaction you have. For me, that's the thing that I've noticed. And I, like I just talked to you about the, my job scenario, I just really had to get a hold of my rampant, crazy mind. I realized that was just like running amok. So yeah, those are my thoughts. But let's, let's go kick it off to Steve to see what he's got to say. Oh, I've been, I've been alive all the time, so it's good that I didn't make any other names. Um, Alan, that, that what you have said reminds me of one of the things that constantly occurs to me is that I think about um, all of these things in my life that are unsatisfactory, and then you share with us, well, I have cancer, and I've had my stomach removed, and that brings any suffering in my life puts it in proper perspective and that I, I, I do not suffer. Um, so what do I what do I do with that? And I think one of the things that arises is that um, yeah, that I need to show up for Sangha uh, and that the Sangha supports you. And without that without that support, without some kind of support, uh, it can be pretty lonely, I suppose. So how do I, how does my compassion manifest itself in this setting? Um, yeah, anything you need, let me know. And it will just sit together and it will be, and it will be great. Um, let me just add that uh, a lot of this sounds like attitude adjustment. And yeah. unfortunately, some of the books on Zen come across that way. If you were just as cool as I am and as calm and you know you could be like me then everything would be fine in your life but uh, if you look at Zen the difference is we have a method uh, Zen is not just preaching from the pulpit and everybody's supposed to take it under advice and, and try to be that way we have a method called Zazen 
That means you sit in the midst of your own soup, <laughs> as uh, Fusatsu was saying. You stew in your own juices, and uh, after a while, you either you know get okay with it, or you something's going to break. And uh, fortunately, for most of us, nothing breaks, and we we become more comfortable in our own skin and more comfortable in all the relationships that we have. So that's the first thing, a relationship of self to other, not self to others, plural, not the social relationship, the self to other, a bodhidharma in the cave, that's the first relationship that we have to resolve. From that, all the other relationships fall into place. If you're not doing the work on the cushion, uh, good luck, it's probably not going to work. On the uh, conference call that uh, Shenzhen and I both join in once in a while, it's a monthly call, the world peace coming out of South Korea, an interfaith kind of panel. Um, we make the, we make the point uh, that they're they're based on Abraham, Abrahamic religions primarily. And sometimes you have a Sikh uh, on there, somebody from uh, Hinduism, and so forth. But we always make the point that there is no world peace without personal peace. And if, if all of us are anxiety and aggravated and antagonistic, then there's never going to be any world peace. We have to become peaceful and patient with the situation as it is, as lamentable as that is, before we can do anything to help bring about world peace. And this was uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's point, we must be world peace. So you can't just be world peace without a method. You can't become peaceful just because you will it to be so. You have to have a way of becoming patient, a way of becoming peaceful. And thank, I wouldn't say God, thank Buddha, you know, Zen has a method. And the in design, it's all about method as well. My background in design is all about method. We, want to, we don't try to fix people. We don't try to change people. We change the environment, we change the product, we change the program so that the people can change because we're offering a better alternative. And that's essentially what Buddha did with the original order in India. He created an alternative way of living. He didn't try to tear down the political structure, that the caste system that existed in India at the time. So Zen and design are very much alike. We employ a method and the method in uh, the interview technique, for instance, is a method of talking with other people where you don't get into that same trap. You can't just will yourself to do that. You have to, you have to practice. You have to learn the method, and then you have to employ it. Same thing with Zazen. We're fortunate to have this method. It's the only real thing we transmit. And you'll know on the, on the web, and you'll, if you've been around Hojo Sensei long enough, one of the things that you'll hear him say, just sit still enough, long enough. That's what he's pointing back to. In, in the South, we call it marinating in your juices. So. <laughs> this is where all the best food comes from. That's true. Sangha online, any other thoughts or? Because y'all roll right into, um, hey, Justin, Joseph, excuse me, hey. Yeah, I, I had a few thoughts. Don't let me overtake if you were trying to shift into another gear. But um, I, I think the only thing that I, I would that's really coming up is like even with our, even our anger deserves patience, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I think there's like there is a balance where it's like, you know, sustaining anger, no matter how righteous it seems and harboring anger. That's, you know, not permitted for disciples of the Buddha. But it's, and it can seem very healthy in our culture, you know what I'm saying? To like, we must take a very ego inflected stand on to have a position. And, but I, I'm hearing this other thing that's about like how easy it is to dissolve anger through meditating on emptiness and like how it, how this method really is extremely powerful. And we talked, somebody mentioned just sitting like a piece of wood and I think the, the method is closer to like, no, you have to sit like a mountain and like there, I guess the thing that I'm thinking about with just diffusing anger is, you know, you don't want to have the most like wounded parts of yourself. Like, I, I don't know. It's like the patience with your anger ends up being patience with a lot of other 
things, a lot of other displaced fear and disgust. And, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's boundary violation, just at like, what, why is your brain wired to produce anger in the first place, you know? And so it's like, it's, it is a real signal from the world and you shouldn't just dissolve it completely and say everything is empty and impermanent. Um, but I, I think the, pr the practice of sitting and how it rewires your brain to give you time I don't know, that does seem really important that like you do need space to maintain equanimity and you can't, I don't know. But yeah, you can't have tea without boiling water. You have to feel anger to be alive. And we have to be patient enough to be able to, to withstand the waves of it, if that may, I don't know. Like, so that, that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, it's important to take a stance, but it's like, we can't cling to any position. I don't know, like that's, anyway. I'm not sure what I'm really going with that. But um, I mean, I, I, anyway, don't let me keep just circling around it. But like, I do think in forbearance when it's like, when, if, if every, you know, the question is who am I and why am I so angry? Like I'm really resonating with what Steve's kind of, you know, formulation here about like, Anyway, I don't know. I think it's worth being patient and trying to tease apart. I feel like you can learn so much about yourself by trying to understand what irritates you. Um, so that's, you know, as a, as a provocation, I don't know. That would, yeah. Anyway, don't let me get. I would say as a quick response to that, and then I'm going to boot it over to Shinjin. Um, anger is not always ego. Anger is often altruistic. Something is being threatened that really should be defended and is precious, and like your family, your children, or Zen. You know, we've had a lot of arguments and fights around here about somebody doing something somebody else didn't thought was not very Zen-like. And it, when you look at it from an objective viewpoint, you can see both sides are trying to defend the Dharma, but in different ways. Both sides have been in argument around Zen, certainly. And, and uh, Shenzhen did a lot of historical reports on how how uh, groups broke up after the great master Dogen, somebody died, you know, and they had all this infighting factions and things. But every, every one of those, we hope and think, is trying to defend the Dharma to the best of their ability. So anger is uh, neutral. It's not really bad, it's not really good. It's just, it's, a, it's something that can be used for bad or good. So I'll boot it over to Shinjin with that. Well, the best analogy I can think of is the martial arts. Uh, you know, well, he's a black belt judo, so he knows where he speaks. Yeah, yeah so I've I've been, you know, studying martial arts all my adult life, and uh, I can tell you that you cannot fight when you're angry. Your body will tense up, and you cannot move it, and you will get your clock clean uh, if you try to fight when you're angry, uh, and. It's a real simple thing to get angry when you've got an opponent trying to hit you and trying to put you on your back. Uh, that's, you know, that won't make you, somebody trying to deliberately hurt you won't make you angry. I don't know what will. But uh, if, if you allow that to take over, your body goes into what they call the startle reflex. And you kind of hunch your shoulders up and you bring your hands up like this, your eyes get real wide and you start leaning forward. You can't fight from there. And uh, you would get told, you, you know, unless you stay stay upright and loose, you know, none of your technique is going to work. Uh, so I kind of look at it like that, you know, take that with you everywhere you go. You've got this, you've got this technique to stay centered and stay calm. You know, it is it's zazen, and if you all of the things that are irritating you make you angry. You know, if you can kind of remain in that kind of composure, that doesn't mean somebody starts irritating, you flop onto the floor and sit like this and wait for them to stop. But, you know, you retain that, that, that composure. So just before we go to John, I wanted to just say this is another example of method. And what the method uh, emphasizes is repetition. So you, in Zazen, in uh, design and music and martial arts, they're all based on learning a method, learning a form, and then repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating until it becomes you know, relatively instinctual. So that under pressure, where you do tend to go bonkers, 
from fear and anger, uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah. If John was up. And I, I would say, you know, from my experience uh, with the martial arts, that it's, it's usually a couple of, just like in here, it's usually a couple of years before people get that looseness when they're fighting. It, it's usually a few years, but when you are in the presence of somebody that's like six or seven feet black belt, they're completely blank. They're, when they're when they're sparring, their faces are completely devoid of any reaction whatsoever. You know, paying so attention to everything, right? They're paying attention to everything, internal and external. And John, I see you. One comment there, but this is what we're talking about with how the sign can support each of us in this as well. John, morning, sir. Just to, just to throw in a a, a small piece a personal piece for me as far as practice and method. And, and Joseph, I'm going to just name you as a, uh, pick on you as a, as a way of, of demoing for a second, if that's okay. Uh, most of my life, I expressed anger like this. I disagree with you, Joseph. That's crazy. That's stupid. Where did you hear that? I mean, this is, this is just, I don't know what you're, you know, trying to do here. And that was uh, a way that I customarily was conditioned in some way to communicate my anger. Today, I'm trying, Hojo, to, to use a method that seems to work better for me. And this is under the label that anger uh, is not bad, that we don't necessarily need to demonize it, maybe acknowledge it. And what it looks like is this, Joseph, when you say those things, I'm noticing, I'm noticing some reactivity here. I'm noticing some anger coming up. Maybe we could explore together what it is about this conversation that triggers this anger that's showing up with a flushed face and all of this reactivity. Joseph, could you and I look at that together? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I, this is a, a kind of an interesting way to, to rephrase that. The, the best person that I ever sparred in my entire life was the silver medalist from the Los Angeles Olympics back in uh, in, the, in the late 80s. And I, this would have been about 96 when I met him. And I probably outweighed him by 30 pounds. I could probably bench press more than he could. And we squared off. The referee had us bow in. And right before we both took our grips, he winked at me. I didn't last 10 seconds. <laughs> Is that the key to just wink at you and yeah, just wink at me? Just wink at him. He's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> but for me, Joseph, thank you for that. Um, your statement that yeah, there's something in anger. I feel like there is something in anger. There's something in everything that arises, and you point it exactly right back to it. Those are the opportunities in self-reflection we we can explore. What is that? Well, yeah, and I think one of the things that it might be, it, it, there's a concept in Japanese in in all of the fighting Japanese fighting arts called katsu. And Katsu doesn't translate into English uh, at all, really. But what it means is that victory was already decided before the fight started because of superior tra uh, training and preparation and attitude. Any other thoughts are from online? Ungan, you're awfully quiet over there. <laughs> You have any thoughts for us? Thanks, Sensei. Was that me you addressed? Yes, it was, Ungen. I was trying to say, see if you had any thoughts over there from, from our uh, Sensei in Florida. Of course I've got thoughts. Um, I struggled my entire career with patience with the path itself. I think we're all oriented 
to achieve. We're goal oriented. I remember when I started, I said, oh, I'm going to give this thing five years. And if I haven't gotten awakened, hell, I'm going to try something different. Hopefully, I've matured a little since then. But you really have to be patient with yourself and with the path. For most of us, anyway, it doesn't come quickly. So just hang in there. And as Hojo says, keep sitting. Shut up and sit. You don't Thanks. just do something, sit there. <laughs> Thanks, Sensei. I'm good. Any other thoughts out there in the ethers? I've checked Facebook. I don't see any comments out there, but does anyone else have any thoughts? Larry, you're sitting back, taking it all in. You know, I had to call on you. You had to see what you got to say over there. I'm, I'm using my patience. Um, I guess the thought that keeps on coming back to me is something that I heard, I guess it was Sinjin say about uh, intention. And I like the idea of the intention of not being attracted or averse to anger or attracted or averse to happiness or attracted or averse to whatever. And, and then as I sit and realize my leg is really hurting and oh my gracious, it just is never gonna end thinking back to again the attraction and aversion and and remembering that these sensations the 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 the, the leg pain will stop it, it does stop whenever i am able to move again and allowing myself the grace and the well patience to remember that that thought is going to arise exist and pass away just like the sensations will arise exist and pass away but that doesn't forgive me, that doesn't give me the grace to walk away from acting on the world, that doesn't give me the grace to not be angry at um, mass shootings or the violence in Ukraine or the violence across the world, it, but it, by any means, I, I'm not forgiven that, I'm not allowed to walk away from it. What I can do is look for the work that's in front of me and try to help my neighbors, try to help uh, the Sangha, try to help the people who live physically next to me, try to help the patients and families that I care for when they come into the hospital and do the right thing for them, whatever that right thing is, as my intention and bring that grace with me and share that with them. Anyways, thank you. Okay, we'll call them out. How about Joy or Sarah? <laughs> you have to inflict a little pain on you sometimes. Joy comes to sit with us in the, mo in the morning, but it's okay. We don't, no pressure. So we're glad to see um, everybody's on the, in the cubes and in the room. So it's good to hear a female perspective on patience. I hear a lot of male perspective on patience here. Men have to be patient with women, but women have to be patient with men. So I'm outnumbered here, so I'll just. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, Joy's right. Joy's just listening and taking it in, and that's totally fine, Joy. Yeah. Thank you so much. The other so, option we have here is the chat where you can, if you don't want to speak out personally, but you do have a question or a comment, you can just put it on the chat and we'll make sure it's read. This is what we do with Facebook. Hey, Steve. I was, um, and, and Larry, and I, I think I don't know most of the people that are in the, in the room today, uh, but I've heard several people, uh, including yourself, uh, that were in helping professions. And a lot of people are nurses or I'm, I'm hearing, I think, uh, other medical, uh, some people may be medical doctors. Um, I'm a university teacher. Um, which is a better word than professor. And we have, this is a gift that we've been given uh, that maybe I can't do much about what's going on in the Ukraine or I can't do much about 
what's going on in the places where there have been mass shootings, but in my local group uh, that I can help um, people that are disturbed uh, if there are, if I have patients that are suffering, if I have medical patients that are suffering, that I can turn my compassion, I can turn my anger to compassion and work with those persons. And just to be able to, you know, this is why I went that talking a lot amongst other reasons, is uh, used to, it used to bother me at the beginning of, of practice is why, why if you're enlightened, why are you still talking? Um, and I realized that one of the answers, one of the answers to that question was, uh, you ask, I answer. Uh, and that my function as a teacher is, you ask me a question, I answer it. Um, and that's, that's almost uh, judo. Is that just, that's the way that it works. Now I may, I may ask you a Socratic question so you never get the answer. You never get an answer from me, you get another question. But uh, I would emphasize the value of being in the helping professions and assisting the larger Sangha that way. And I would suggest looking at every profession as a helping profession. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the meaning of white livelihood. Enjoy. Uh, thanks so much. She said, I will say that I am learning that when my patience is quote unquote thin, I am lacking surren surrendering to what is. Any comments on that? Yeah, our posture is one of surrender. So if you're sitting cross-legged, for instance, you can't really suddenly bolt and run and you can't fight unless you're a highly trained martial artist in that posture. So the posture is one of surrender. And uh, I think we, we speak of a mental posture as well. We take a view or a posture towards reality. I think it's uh, basically one of surrender. And it doesn't mean, as we said before, we surrendered everything and just let everything go, hell in a handbasket. But we, we surrender to the possibility and probability that there's not much we can do. And so that says, do your utmost, because it's not going to turn out to be much, no matter how much you do. Not a reason for not taking action. Zen is a way of action, such as in the martial art. Any other comments? Or we're good on Facebook. There's no comments. No other comments in the chat. Any other last thoughts from the Sangha? And then I'll uh, kick it over to Shinshin and say this if he has any last words for. Nice. Um, and again, as always, for community practice, check out the community practice page up under the teachings on ASCC. Um, we'll be coming back in July to talk about one of my favorite, uh, Virja or Vigor. Yeah, yeah, Vigor. I don't have a problem with that one. No, <laughs> so, no, you do not. <laughs> so, as always, uh, Sangha, we are so grateful for your practice and your presence. You want to wait for after the bell to do the, the now? Yeah, let's ring the bells okay. to and do the closing verse to close the um, the Dharma part of portion, and then we'll have a few announcements. I have a couple of announcements of good news that I'd like you to hear. Okay, right, so the, bells, the, the closing verses. verse is uh, the four vows. We do them three times. Beings are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to earn them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable, I vow to realize it. Beings are numberless, I vow to free them. Illusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end it. Our gates are boundless, I vow to end it. The blue way is unsurpassable, I vow to realize it. Beings are numberless, I vow to see them. Illusions are inexhaustible, I 
So my announcements are very brief. Uh, we have uh, we're going segueing back into in-person practice here. So we're offering uh, Dokusan in the 9:30 period on Sunday morning, starting in the 9:30 period. So you have the first period to sit, and uh, those who want to avail yourselves of that, then um, we are um, just received. Uh, new contract for the third book to be published. I am pleased to be sending the contract for a modern master of Zen. This is a modern master of Zen, the collected wisdom of Soyu Matsuoka Roshi. Those of you who've read his collected talks, you have most of the content. You've read most of the content. And uh, what we're doing is putting these together in short readers, about 200 pages or less. And uh, the first one is about why Zen. And uh, uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Buddha is, is Zazen practice, Dharma, and so forth, all the things that Matsuoka Roshi had to say about that. That'll be coming out in 2024. At the end of this year, um, my second book uh, called The Razor Blade of Zen will be will drop toward the end of this year. So we'll let you know when that's happening. So this is the third book in the series, but this is actually going to be a set of probably four to four to six readers possibly. There's a lot of material to uh, digest and we're reorganizing by group. So it's more, I'm taking out a lot of the anecdotal stuff that some of you may have be familiar with so that it acts more as a reader of golden nuggets and the philosophy and wit and wisdom actually of uh, Matsuoka Roshi. So look forward to that, that's a positive thing. Again, please uh, be on the lookout for that. We, as those things get closer in, we'll start to, to promote those. And again, Sangha, as always, appreciate your practice and your presence as always. Um, again, we are so grateful for the folks that are contributing normally because it keeps our teacher fed and it keeps our lights on and it keeps us the opportunity to continue to have a residential, you know, actually a place to practice. Um, but for those have, who not have, are not consistent givers, if you would find value in what we do, we ask that you consider that. As, a, as an offering. But again, as always, thank you so much. Um, we'll end with um, Hojo's just uh, sit still enough long enough. You know where to reach us if you need anything, and I really appreciate it. Um, I did want to mention one other thing. Uh, we're, we are, we tried, um, we're starting up the retreat uh, system again, and wrapping a retreat around just that Saturday, every second Saturday, second weekend of the month. So it's a Friday night, seven to nine, or Saturday morning, seven to nine, Saturday evening, 7 to 9, and Sunday morning, 7 to 9, which will segue into this program. So those of you who are proximic or local and who can uh, make your way to the Zen Center, every second weekend of each month, we're going to be offering this. There's a registration page. If you think you can take the time out to do that, it means uh, another 17 hours or so sitting that weekend. Uh, if if you're participating on our Just Sit Saturday, which happens nine to four on Saturdays now. We're wrapping this retreat around, piggybacking it on that. We encourage you to start coming in person again unless we have another variant pop up. <laughs> and thank you so much for your practice and presence. Have a great rest of the day and the week. And if you need anything, reach out. Gosh, everyone.